Good afternoon, everyone. Um, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Ben Arundel. I'm uh, based in Barbados at Seidel Bank and Trust. And uh, my co-presenter is... I'm Chris Pfeifferlich. I'm from uh, EY, but I also uh, work with the uh, Business and Industry Advisory Council to the OECD. And uh, we're going to talk about how BEPS and um, it's going to affect non-OECD members. It's, it's, it's coincidental that Chris and I are presenting on this topic because I spent 26 years of my working life with, with Ernst & Young before I retired about four years ago. Yeah. So, uh, so it's interesting. Okay, so I'm going to kick it off by um, giving you just a, a brief introduction to the BEPS uh, project and the action plan. Uh, the main rationale, if I can get this thing working, the main rationale for the BEPS project uh, is that there is a feeling, particularly amongst OECD countries, that the consensus-based framework adopted by countries to eliminate double taxation, uh, while at the same time it preserves uh, sovereignty, it's been put at risk by gaps created in the interaction between the domestic tax rules of countries and the activities of tax planners, and to some extent also the interaction of the double taxation treaties with the domestic legislation. Uh, there has been certainly concern by uh, countries over the allocation of taxing rights between the residence country and the source country under existing double taxation agreements. And certainly uh, in my time with the United Nations Group of Experts on International Tax Cooperation, there was significant discussion between the uh, larger, uh, the, the developed countries and the, particularly the larger developing countries like China uh, and Brazil and Japan uh, about the allocation of taxing rights, particularly in relation to, to services. And Ben, I, I think that's a great point. One thing I would say to this group that while tax havens are, quote, the focus of this project, I actually think the bigger long-term disputes will be between uh, China, India, the emerging markets, and the U.S., U.K., et cetera, and they'll, they'll be arguing about uh, taxing rights source versus residence for years to come. Uh, absolutely. I, I think particularly in relation to services and also, as we'll get on to uh, later on, particularly also in relation to the digital economy. Yeah. So, uh, the, I'm going to, um, we're going to divide up the presentation, but we're going to interact. I'm going to focus uh, mainly on uh, the topics that you see on the, uh, on the screen there, addressing the challenges of the digital economy, uh, looking at hybrid uh, instruments and the effects on, of hybrid instruments on uh, um, uh, base erosion, uh, strengthening of the CFC rules. I'm not going to talk much about that. I'm also not going to talk much about the, uh, limiting the base erosion uh, through looking at interest um, um, deductions and so on. I think Chris might deal with some of that sure. in his transfer pricing. Uh, counter harmful tax practices, there's really not much to say on that except that uh, the OECD uh, are proposing to, uh, to revamp uh, the whole OECD harmful tax competition. Right, but again, for this group, I, I think the fair question to ask is how low of a tax rate can you have bef before it becomes harmful ca tax competition? Because um, I went to a meeting in South America and some of the countries were saying, we want to encourage investment, mm -hmm. and how low can we go? And they criticized another country that is uh, at the forefront of BEPS but yet has their own uh, favorable tax regimes. And so they said, you know, you've got to have some consistency here. Right, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I also got to talk about um, measures to prevent tax treaty abuse. And uh, the, the, the OECD in the BEPS um, report said that this was one of the main areas that they wanted to focus on. Um, uh, prevent the artificial avoidance of uh, permanent establishment status. Well, again, I'm not going to talk much about that. That's ongoing work. And I can comment the OECD on that. And, the, and the UN. And you can comment on that, absolutely. So, OK. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, uh, the hybrid uh, mismatch arrangements, and uh, I think this will also dovetail into yes. transfer pricing as well. There was a consultation document published on the 19th of March. Comments were requested by uh, May the 2nd, a very short time frame in which to, um, to make comments. Um, the paper, uh, the consultation document, defined a hybrid mismatch arrangement as a profit-shifting arrangement that utilizes a hybrid element in tax treatment of an entity on, on instruments to produce a mismatch in tax outcomes in respect of a payment that is made under that arrangement. That's, uh, that's really a, bit, a little, bit of a, little bit of a mouthful. 
Um, the recommendation in the report is that they were targeting three categories of hybrid mismatch arrangements. The first one is hybrid financial instruments. And this is where the payments are deductible in one jurisdiction, but not included income in the pays jurisdiction. So for example, one, one um, example I, I had was uh, a situation where you would have a, a Dutch company that would uh, make a loan to a US company, um, and it would be a, a profit uh, participating loan. And uh, unless the rules have changed in the Netherlands and, and in the US, uh, what would happen is that for US purposes, that was treated as debt, and the interest was deductible, uh, zero withholding tax uh, under the Dutch-US treaty. And in the Netherlands, uh, it would be treated as a dividend, uh, because the, the instrument would be treated as, as, as equivalent to shares, and would be subject to the participation exemption in the Netherlands that would not be taxed. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, a, that's a very simple example of your classic hybrid financial instrument. Um, the other one would be a hybrid entity payment, uh, where you have an entity where there's a difference in the categorization of the, of the payer, uh, which result in a deductible payment being disregarded or a double, ta or a double deduction being obtained. So you, you typically you would have an intervening company um, where um, you, the entity will be treated as tax transparent for one jurisdiction by one jurisdiction, and the other jurisdiction would treat it as, uh, as opaque for tax purposes. I think an example of that was, uh, again, this was, uh, this was the US, and it was a situation where you could have a Canadian company uh, that would uh, invest in a Barbados uh, society with restricted liability, which would check the box for US tax purposes, the Barbados entity would make a loan to the U a US um, subsidiary or affiliated company. Uh, the interest will be deductible in the US. Um, and you would look through the Barbados entity, because you would check the box, and you would look to the Canada-US treaty, and uh, zero withholding tax on that treaty in those days. And f from a Barbados perspective, it's opaque. From a Canadian perspective, the SRL is opaque. The dividends would be treated as exempt surplus in Canada and would be exempt. So the US changed their rules yes. uh, in order to, to, uh, to get rid of uh, that arrangement. Um, I won't talk much about the reverse hybrid and uh, imported mismatches. That's, that's a bit complex and probably um, too complex for, for this discussion. Uh, the next item I'd like to uh, just talk about is tax, tax treaty abuse. And the discussion draft was issued on March 17th and comments were requested by April 11th. Uh, there was a, a, a public consultation, uh, April 14th to 15th, uh, and comments were uh, submitted by a wide cross-section of the business community. And you can see a, a list of some of, just some of the uh, entities that commented. Uh, the draft really focused on three areas. Uh, developing model treaty provisions, and recommendations regarding the design of domestic law provisions to prevent treaty benefits being obtained in inappropriate circumstances. Uh, the, the term inappropriate circumstances is a new term in term in, with regard to uh, uh, treaty uh, interpretation. Um, the, the OECD also feel that there is a need to clarify that treaty should not be used to obtain double non-taxation. And there are many examples uh, where uh, because of the mismatch, between domestic legislation of two countries and the intervention of the treaty, you could end up with a situation where income is taxed uh, in, in, in neither country. Uh, and the third is to identify the tax policy consideration that countries should consider before deciding to enter into a tax treaty with another country. I mean, interestingly enough, that's a discussion um, that um, we had in the, in the UN committee of experts on uh, this whole issue, that we felt that this is something that should, should really be, uh, be looked at, investigated, uh, and, and analyzed. And I would just say, uh, Ben, the second point is the single most important thing that they want to try to cure. And if there's other ways to cure it than through limitation of benefits or main purpose tests, they're, they're open to hearing that. But I think the countries have a legitimate point, and I used to work for the revenue, I think you did too. Mm -hmm. uh, a double tax treaty is meant to uh, allow for the avoidance of double tax and cede jurisdiction from the source to the residents. It was never meant for taxpayers to use it to avoid taxation altogether. And you know, it's certainly within companies 
prerogative to be as aggressive as they want, but it, you're going to have to earn that going forward. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so the main proposals, and, and none of this is new. I, sh I should say that that none of this is new. These are these are topics that have been discussed for many many years. Um, so the main proposals uh, with respect to tax treaty abuse and um, to uh, limit those. Um, uh, is to do with the amendments to the OECD model treaty and the treaty provisions uh, dealing with limitation on benefits provisions. And the proposal is really um, uh, a proposal which uh, mimics uh, the U.S. limitation on benefits provision in the U.S. model. And that is in uh, a number of the U.S. Uh, treaties. Would you agree with that, Chris? Yes, absolutely. In fact, uh, most of the other countries don't like limitation of benefits, and they don't like this as a uh, default provision for the uh, anti-abuse uh, paper. So they're, they're trying to come up with something else, as you note there with the main purpose test. Yeah, yeah. And of course, I mean, the, I won't go through all of the elements. I mean, if you're a publicly traded company um, uh, in your country of residence, then you can qualify. Uh, there are some limitations to that. If you're a subsidiary of a publicly traded company, you can also qualify for the benefits of the treaty. Uh, there is also uh, an ownership and base erosion test for those companies that are not uh, listed. Um, and there's an active trade or business test. Uh, there is also the provision for the uh, competent authority of the source country uh, to give relief even if the, the company fails uh, any of those uh, tests. Um, where the company makes a, a case that treaty benefits should, uh, should not be denied. Uh, however, there is no specific provision for granting uh, derivative benefits. Uh, an example of where you would grant derivative benefits is where you have uh, a company uh, in country A uh, which owns, uh, let's say, a subsidiary in country B and also a subsidiary in country C. and. Um, uh, it, uh, it owns intellectual property, which it licenses to the company in country C. Uh, that, com that company sub-licenses uh, the, prop the intellectual property to the company in country B. And the treaty between country B and country A and country B and country C both uh, 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 pro provide for a zero withholding tax on royalties paid in respect of that intangible property. However, in country C, the royalties are subject to a low level of taxation, so let's say a preferential regime. And uh, in those situations, you would argue that uh, the, uh, the, 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 even though they, they could be said to be treaty shopping, there was no advantage being gained by the taxpayer, because if the royalty was paid directly to the parent in country A, there would be no withholding, and paid to uh, the uh, the affiliate in country C, there is no withholding, uh, and so therefore th there, is no, there is no treaty shopping, one would argue, but there is no provision in the, uh, in the proposals for this, although they did say that they would welcome uh, recommendations uh, in, in respect of this. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the main purpose test, I mean, Chris, do you want to? Right, I mean, it's, it's, it's a problematic um, way to deal with treaty abuse because it, it leaves to the tax authorities the subjective determination whether a primary purpose or an important aspect of the structuring was to uh, avoid taxation. And just think about all the litigation that goes on in transfer pricing and other matters. You will have this on steroids and you'll have different, you'll have the tax authorities arguing with each other and you'll have the, the taxpayers arguing with each other. And so again, the, one of the points of the OECD is to promote international trade, promote growth, and, and all those things. And yes, sometimes you have to compromise and make things simple. The main purpose test would be a disaster in enforceability. It would make, actually make uh, the uncertainty in foreign investment greater, not less. And so it, it could actually backfire uh, if they adopt that. And that's just my personal opinion, but I think there's others who adopt that. In fact, I mean, uh, there are many treaties that have that, that test, and uh, tax authorities find it very difficult to implement. The well, other it's funny that you say about the UN experts. Uh, who's the delegate from Norway, the tall, uh, bald guy, uh, uh, um, Serge C. Uh, uh, but anyway, Sven, 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 Sven yeah. Yeah, yeah. But he was telling some of the emerging markets that um, they were resistant to the treaties, and he said, you want the OECD or US treaty because companies understand that. You pick your own treaty, they won't know <laughs> what they're getting into, and they still won't invest, so. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. And I think in terms of uh, when you look at um, venture capital funds, 
Um, you look at uh, collective investment vehicles yes. um, that want uh, maybe a tax neutral jurisdiction, um, but also want to have uh, the benefit of, uh, of a double, ta double taxation agreement, and they're widely held. Mm -hmm. um, so you can't say that the shareholders of that uh, CIV uh, are actually um, uh, treaty shopping. Correct. Uh, because the, the entity is widely held. And, uh, under the main purpose test, it would be very difficult, I think, mm -hmm. for that entity to qualify for treaty benefits. Uh, tiebreaker rule for dual resident companies. Again, I won't spend too much time on that. Um, it's just that uh, under the current OECD model, we have a company which is resident in two countries uh, under both countries' domestic legislation. Um, the treaty provides uh, for a tiebreaker, uh, which says that it will be resident for the purposes of the treaty in the country in which uh, the, the effective management of the company is, uh, is carried on. Uh, the proposal is to, is to get rid of that and say that um, it, it should go to a determination between uh, the two tax authorities, uh, and they should take into account um, the effective management as well as where the company is incorporated. But at the end of the day, there is no certainty um, that the, 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 the authorities will come to a decision. And if they don't, then the company is not entitled to the benefits uh, of the treaty. Um, I think um, statement as to the intent of tax treaties, um, there is a proposal um, to amend the title and the preamble and to make it uh, even wider by saying that uh, it is meant to eliminate double taxation without creating opportunities for non-taxation or, re or reduce taxation through tax evasion or avoidance, including through treaty shopping arrangements. And in terms of the tax policy considerations that countries should take into account, I mean, I think all of those are standard. There, was, there really is nothing, nothing new there. And it, there have been public comments, and uh, I think as you alluded to, um, to, to Chris, that uh, some of the proposals, um, many of the respondents have said that they, don't, they actually don't favor those proposals. Right, and to the extent you guys are tax people and you want to see what those comments were, the OECD has um, a website, obviously, and on it they um, recorded the uh, consultation that they had last month. And so if you want to see the presenters, and it's long, it's about six, eight hours, you can listen to the various discussions. And they had people who used to be former revenue uh, administrators talk about uh, the pros and cons of the various proposals that was raised in the paper. I think I will just go through those because you can see those comments for yourselves. Now, in terms of the impact on offshore jurisdictions, I probably want to leave that, Chris, until okay. you talked a bit about the transfer pricing. All right. So shall we All get right, so to um, can you switch to my slide deck? Did it go to sleep? <laughs> I can tell you the password if it. <laughs> <laughs> it's there. Okay, thank you. There we go. Okay. So I'm going to spend the rest of the uh, half hour, or the hour, I should say, talking about uh, the transfer pricing aspects of the BEPS action points. And if you follow some of the politics that go with the BEPS initiative in the first place, Many politicians, rightly or wrongly, it's probably a mixture, frankly, believe that a lot of the under-reporting of tax obligations is a function of poor transfer pricing. If you hear the NGOs talk about it, they call it mispricing. And so we're going to talk about some of the uh, aspects of that. One of the things I wanted to talk to you about is uh, an organization called the Business Industry and Advisory Council, BIAC. BIAC is the official lobbying group, if you will, to the OECD, and they have an effective means of communicating with the OECD on various topics, including tax. To the extent you, your company, your country are interested in, in doing, uh, getting involved, I would encourage you to uh, think about participating in BIAC. Usually most countries have local representations that feed into BIAC, but uh, one of the things that is frustrating, and I wouldn't say frustrating, but uh, a little disappointing to the OECD right now is that they're not getting a wide uh, global perspective in these consultations. It's mostly Europe and some U.S. participants. They're looking for emerging markets, Asia, et cetera, and they're not getting that. And I know travel is expensive and difficult to Paris, but uh, a lot of these uh, presentations can be made in writing, and at least your comments can be considered. And the other thing they're con 
uh, encouraging is talking to your local tax authority and making sure that your tax authorities are getting input into the process. It's interesting you should say that, Chris, because uh, in the Caribbean, there certainly has been uh, concern that the Caribbean countries and Caribbean uh, international financial centers have uh, not made their voices heard in this discussion. Uh, and um, the Caribbean Export Development uh, Agency has been tasked by the by Cariforum countries uh, to represent uh, the Caribbean countries. And there is a task force that has been set up to do that. And I think that task force should um, participate in all of these discussions and particularly, I think, through BIAC. And I think that's a good suggestion, which I'll take back with me. I think so, Ben, because I mean, I think this is a political issue. I think small island economies that are legitimate, which they are, have to have some way to uh, attract foreign investment and provide for economic uh, development for their people. Now, I, I, I think where there's just post office boxes and nobody there, uh, that's problematic. So you'll see Leslie Stahl from CBS run around uh, the islands, or she'll go to Switzerland. She went to uh, Zug, Switzerland, I think, a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. And she showed a couple of these uh, mailboxes where, where there's no corporate uh, presence. I'm sure she could find that in any country. I'm sure she can find that in the United States. She can find it in Delaware. In fact, I'd be happy to take her up to uh, uh, Wilmington. We can go through all the mailboxes together <laughs> if that's what she wants to do. But the, and, and, the, and the sincere point about it is there are a lot of companies that actually have presence. And you can go through example after example. Uh, in fact, you, I don't know if you know this, but the highest concentration of Ferraris and La Lamborghinis in the world is in Zug, Switzerland, because there's a lot of trading and financial management activity in that ca canton. So there are a lot of legitimate businesses. Bermuda is another classic example. Mm -hmm. Bermuda runs a legitimate reinsurance operation that's recognized around the world. It's regulated. It has people on the island. Uh, you can, it has, it's capitalized, the markets recognize it, okay. AM Best recognizes it. So to your point, I think the political aspect of, of, of this of the, of the, of the islands is to make sure that they show that they are willing to provide okay. sufficient substance to uh, enjoy the fruits of the uh, income that's being reported there. The last point I would make is, um, is that this is not a, totally an OECD process. The OECD typically takes a long time to come up with policy guidelines, and they do that through what's called a consensus process. And consensus doesn't mean unanimity, but it does mean there's no violent objections to the proposals that are coming forth. And so typically, uh, an OECD process can take 5, 10, 15 years to evolve as people get more comfortable with facts and circumstances of the law. This uh, BEPS is not a G20, I'm sorry, it's not an OECD process, it's a G20 process. And so uh, consensus is not the standard. That's one of the reasons why they're going very fast. And in fact, if I dare say, uh, the consensus basically is lowest common denominator. Some countries can say, we're going to pull out of the process if we don't get what we want. And so the other countries who may not think that this is a great uh, policy issue, if they, are, if they are not equally willing to pull away because of this uh, lowest common denominator, then the lowest common denominator comes into effect and they live with it. And so you're going to see some things that come out in the various action points which would not uh, necessarily uh, be acceptable to all countries. I raise this because the problem is the BEPS action plan is meant to be implemented on a multilateral basis. So the idea is everybody's supposed to come to an agreement and apply these rules at the same time so that we can all go and tax a multinational, if you will, on a similar basis, reduce controversy, et cetera, et cetera. It's unlikely that's going to happen. You're going to see different rules on thin capitalization, on what a permanent establishment is, what a digital permanent mm -hmm. establishment is, uh, on treaty modifications, et cetera, et cetera. And so in some ways, the fear about BEPS is that it will be a failure, not a success. It's a failure if countries go and create their own rules which are not consistent with each other. Can you, can you comment on um, the fact that it, although it is, I mean, it's a G20 uh, project, um, but the OECD has been charged with uh, carrying forward that project. Yes. And what they have done is that they have widened it to include non-OECD member countries. Correct. But those, as I understand it, those non-OECD member countries are not actually, if you like, members of the, of the, the task force. No, they're, uh, they're voting members. They are. China's a voting member, India's a voting member. But not all. Not all, okay. but there's... So um, the smaller ones are, are correct. sort of um, observers or, yes. or some sort of status. So the non-OECD G20 are voting. Mm -hmm. I think the non-OECD observers are not voting. Right, right. So, so uh, how do you think those countries that are non-voting will have an impact on, on the process? I think if the process becomes too one-sided in favor of 
of the OECD countries where mm -hmm. the OECD countries, for example, keep the country by country reporting template and don't share it unless there's a treaty, mm -hmm. that will annoy them. And in fact, I think some of the politics of what's going on is that, for example, they want to make sure that there's enough acceptance of the BEPS process that there's a chance that, the, for better or for worse, the country by country template will be shared with all countries right. on a simultaneous basis because the countries who don't have treaties saying, well, we're disadvantaged. How do we get this if we don't have a treaty? You're, mm -hmm. It's a catch-22, if you yeah. will. Yeah. Now, Ben already went through the, um, the 15 uh, target uh, areas, but as you can tell, maybe a third to half of them have transfer pricing uh, aspects, which I'm going to cover here uh, briefly. The single biggest thing that is on the G20 BEPS initiative is country by country reporting. I think countries legitimately feel frustrated that they never understand the big picture of a company's total global profit and tax uh, profile. They really want to see the whole picture. So think about a movie. See, think about a trailer to a movie that you saw and you thought, oh, this is going to be a great movie. It looks exciting, these people are really fast or whatever, and then you go see the movie and it's really boring or it's everything but the, what the trailer said. And if you, think, if you think critically that transfer pricing looks at certain things of a corporation but not all things, and you think that the, the tax or transfer pricing consultants are spin doctors, and I don't think that's necessarily true, but just if you want to take the worst case scenario, then the countries think that they're just getting a trailer that's all biased that makes it look like uh, the taxpayers are doing everything correctly, but they have not had a chance to see the movie. They want to see the movie, and they want to judge for themselves that what you're telling them in the trailer is in fact true. So in that regard, they're going to insist that companies create a multi or global uh, form which discusses their total profits, their total headcount, their total tax paid and accrued on a year-by-year -year basis, and how that's apportioned amongst the various countries. And it's not intended to be formulary apportionment, but the idea is if you have 50 percent of your global workforce in the United States and only 5 percent of the profit year after year after year, maybe there's something amiss. It doesn't prove that there's a transfer pricing problem, but it might suggest that there's risk from which they're supposed to go to the uh, transfer pricing documentation to see if there's a mispricing or misapplication of the law. This country by country reporting template will be finalized this month. The working party is meeting, if not this week, next week. I think it's next week. There's going to be a public, final public consultation in Paris on May 19th. If you are interested in it, it would mean you have to get up at 3.30 East Coast time, maybe 4.30 or 5.30 in Island time, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. But you could actually watch and stream the and watch the presentation by streaming. And they're going to talk about the remaining open issues. They're probably going to signal where they're going to reach consensus. They're going to make a final determination by the end of um, May, and they have a process where they have to give it to the... Uh, the Committee for Fiscal Affairs that runs the OECD, and then they, they will either accept it, the recommendation or make some tweaks. But the goal is to finish the country-by-country country reporting template by the end of uh, September. And then the issue is, when does this become effective for companies? I would think, pragmatically speaking, it's 2016. The reason why it can be as early as 2016, I don't think it could be 2015, is that Information reporting is typically an executive branch function, at least in a U.S., U.K. context, and the local tax administrator can adopt rules to say you will provide this information in the context of your tax return. Bob Stack, the U.S. Secretary of Treasury in the United States, said he doesn't need a congressional uh, uh, provision to do this. He has broad authority to uh, create information reporting. And moreover, they've already said they, they already have all this information they consider redundant, but obviously they will take it since it's going to be given to other countries. Here's the template. Um, I could not make it very readable, but again, this is the worst case scenario that was put out in January. The actual template will be much smaller than this. And it, initially, they wanted it entity by entity and country by country, and they wanted uh, the the uh, salaries of your top 25 executives. Can you imagine trying to get that information? Uh, they wanted uh, royalties paid, royalties received, interest paid, interest received, uh, services fees paid, services paid, received. They wanted to break it out between intercompany and third party. It, it got really excessive. There was a lot of pushback because uh, some companies represented that they would have to enter in over hundreds of thousands of entry points to comply with this, quote, high-risk assessment. So the tax authorities cut back to something that's more reasonable. And it's basically, it's going to be a, a headcount, 
uh, consolidated entities in a country basis, though you're going to have to list all your operating entities and branches in a separate document. And you need to provide both cash tax paid and cash tax, I'm sorry, tax accrued. Some countries are worried that tax accrued and tax paid may never actually align over time. Uh, information on the highest 25 employees is not required. It may be required that you disclose effective place of management, and I think that's interesting in the context of your treaty discussion. Mm -hmm. But one of the reasons they want effective place of management is with respect to allocation of profit related to the development of intangibles and risk assumption. Uh, the tax authorities are annoyed by special purpose vehicles in low tax jurisdictions where they might be highly capitalized and have one or two people who purportedly manage uh, global intellectual property. They don't think that is sufficient to earn residual profit on a going forward basis, and we'll talk about that in a minute. The quid pro quo, if you will, for the, the um, country by country reporting is tax authorities want all countries to accept a global master file or common transfer pricing analysis. So right now, many countries require separate transfer pricing reports. The U.S. started it back in 1994. Now many countries have the same thing. And it is costly, and it is somewhat difficult to reconcile some of the differences from country to country. Not, not every country has exactly the same arm's length standard pr principles, and you have to tweak it. So the idea is if a company uh, produces an overall picture of their supply chain, uh, their headcount, and key aspects of how they run their company, they only need to provide local files that deal with specific material transactions on a country by country basis. Again, my experience is that tax authorities tend not to really respect global documentation. They always want things their way. They want their own language translations. They want their own comparables. And I, I don't know how many of you practice or deal with transfer pricing. It's very hard to find third party information about how arm's length transactions should be uh, done. The U.S. is unique because of all the public information that is in SEC filings, but you don't see that throughout the world, and it's hard to uh, benchmark information. And you would think with a master file, you'd see a lot more global comp sets. In fact, the irony is a lot of the emerging um, market tax authorities want these safe harbors and uh, global comp sets for middle and back office services. They don't want to spend time, and they just like to get down to uh, you know, a, a fair analysis of what the residual profit should be for IP or risk, uh, develop, risk transactions. Um, I'm not going to get into the uh, contents or how you structure a master file, but just to say that it is different than a typical local file. Uh, the next big item that's coming out of the OECD is an update on intangibles. It's interesting. I, you know, I mentioned earlier how it in t um, OECD thought processes take a long time to bake. Mm -hmm. And this project has been on the uh, front burner, back burner for a long time, though. It's been cooking slowly. And they were doing this well before BEPS was instituted. And when BEPS came out, um, I asked one of the t OECD folks if this would be swept into BEPS. And they said, oh, no, of course not. This is separate. And then lo and behold, three months later, it's now part of BEPS. Mm -hmm. And one of the issues on intangibles is whether the arm's length standard as is is sufficient to deal with the allocation of profits for cross-licensing of intellectual property within a multinational group. And I think there's a lot of critics who say that's not true, and I, and I think there's some good points to that. And I think the good point to it is that it's hard to value intangibles to begin with. Who knows what the value of the Coke trademark is? Who knows what the value of some uh, algorithm is for some bank or some uh, high-tech company? Uh, there are no market comparables. And so the issue is how would you pay for that? How would you, uh, pay for that, well, most people who have valuable intangibles will not sell them to third parties. That's the whole point. They keep them for themselves. And even when they do license, it's very hard to get those licensing arrangements because a lot of the licensing arrangements are a function of the market that they're going to be exploited in. If you were to look at some literature, uh, you'll see that trademarks uh, from American companies have different values in different countries. Uh, if you're an American company under the George W. Bush administration, an American trademark wasn't as valuable as, say, a, a foreign trademark, whereas maybe uh, in Canada there was no, uh, no problem with it. So anyway, it, the point is it's very difficult. And so recognizing this difficulty, the intangibles paper is going to come up with a special rule called that in the event that you can't price reliably these intangibles, they're going to have special circumstances. And the special circumstances means that there will be an allocation of group-wide synergies based on a number of factors. It could be headcount, it could be sales, it could be a combination of those things. 
What those uh, special factors are, we, we have not seen yet or heard about, but we expect that we'll get that uh, information sometime in May or early June. Uh, I'm going to give you a slide here about, I'm sorry, wrong way. And again, I know a lot of you are not tax people, but I just wanted to give you a quick uh, slide of how the allocation of profits for intangibles has evolved and where it's going. So back in the 80s, legal title was king. If you registered the IP, that's all it took. Even if you didn't deploy it in the foreign markets or whatever, you, are t we were, you were entitled to the profits because under the arms length standard, only a owner or a licensor could earn profit. Well, that got abused. A lot of court cases, I won't get into them. So in the 1990s, the US and some other countries came up with a shared ownership. And so it could be economic owner as well as legal owner. In fact, with an emphasis on economic owner. Economic owner meaning who spent the money to create the IP. So if you had an offshore entity, uh, Luxembourg, Ireland, Switzerland, you name it, and they funded the development and they are actually at risk. And there's a classic case about that which went south for that company. It was Xerox. Xerox actually developed IP back in the 80s and 90s. The IP went bust, and they had all those stranded losses with uh, no income in a low tax jurisdiction. But in most cases, the tax authorities think that uh, these economic owners do it when they know it's going to be successful, and so they, they're always worried or unconcerned when it happens uh, uh, when you go to Ireland, for example. So they don't like economic ownership. They're going to disregard economic ownership, and they're going to now look at three functions. Who actually made decisions to create the IP? Who did fund it? and the funding being a deployment funding as much as a capital or funding of the development itself, and then who actually exploited it to create value. And that will be the way you're going to divide the residual profit related to core or unique intangibles. And that, in my view, is going to be very difficult, will increase controversy. Yes, it will reduce uh, double, double non-tax, but it will certainly increase uh, tax controversy. And particularly, I think, between the countries where uh, there already is a legitimate tax base, whether it's India, China versus the U.S. or versus the U.K., uh, we're already seeing issues about how to allocate profit related to intangibles developed in business manufacturing. So is the manufacturing process in China or India something that's so unique that they should get more than a return for a manufacturing service? I've covered that, these points at a high level, so I won't go into details. The next big area I think especially this audience would care about, but financial services companies, banks, et cetera, will care about is high risk transactions in transfer pricing. So a lot of the value chain of a multinational relates to its risk profile. Think about a lot of companies that have gone under. It's because they had a risk uh, problem. If you look at the economic literature on what the value chain of risk is versus assets versus functions, it's somewhere between 25 and 40 percent. And there are many companies who actually make a lot of money by managing risk well. Uh, you know, one of the classic examples, and it's public information, is Southwest Airlines. Southwest Airlines has never had a loss in, in any quarter. They, they do a number of things to manage them, themselves well. They hedge uh, gas prices. Uh, they, uh, they forecast well. I mean, there's, there's literature and books about it. But what's amazing about it is the stock market rewards them for that lack of for that redu reduced volatility and those lack of losses. And then there was a time when Southwest Airlines actually market cap was equal to the market cap of all the other U.S. airlines put together. And that was an anomaly, but it was just interesting the fact that managing risk well can be rewarded by the market. Well, the, I I'm sorry, the OECD is going to recognize that, but only to a degree. So they're, going to, they're not going to throw special purpose vehicles and funding structures under the bus. They're not going to disregard them under general anti-avoidance. But instead, they're going to say, listen, if people are deploying that capital, the research and development in the US, even though it's being funded out of Cayman or out of Ireland or out of Luxembourg, all we're going to give to those countries is a routine return. They're not going to get the residual return. So we're going to give them cost plus, we're going to give them 20 percent markup on their capital at risk. Mm -hmm. So that is going to be a problematic issue. And if you're interested in what the market really does, there's a study out of the University of Pepperdine, and they, um, they benchmark every year the various returns for collateralized debt obligations, loans, um, high yield, and venture capital. And it's interesting, venture capitalists, on average, make between 60 and 80% a year because they have a lot of bust. And if you have bust, you need booms to offset the bust. Whether the uh, tax authorities recognize that or not, it remains to be seen. So what do you think the impact will be on um, 
uh, the offshore financial centers because uh, if um, an entity that's set up in an offshore financial center um, to own the intangible, uh, license it to companies around the world, yeah. and the, uh, the, uh, on the new transfer pricing rules, the amount that's going to be allocated to the offshore financial center will be less. Yep. Do you think that will uh, lessen the use of uh, offshore financial centers? I think so, unless they put more people in there. So, you know, you and I talked about this when we were prepping. I think what this audience has to think about is putting more people who have PhDs in science or actuaries or whatever. So, I think the Bermuda market is a good example. If you go to Bermuda, and I do occasionally, there are a lot of former chief actuaries from other companies who are in semi-retirement or but are running reinsurance companies. And reinsurance is a lot easier to run than insurance. Uh, reinsurance looks at the whole portfolio of a, of a set of risk, and it doesn't take a lot of people to do that. You need capital, you've got to have a couple actuaries, you've got to have some staff, but you can run a legitimate business uh, with leverage, if you will. I think th these countries have to think more about leverage and, and people with the uh, sophistication to make those decisions as well as being capitalized. And then I think you have to tease out that if there are R&D centers in India or the U.S. or Canada, that cost plus three or five is probably not the right transfer pricing. You're going to have to give them a little bit more money to appease the tax authorities. I mean, I think to your point in terms of uh, the substance and having, having people on the ground, I mean, I had one situation where a Canadian pharmaceutical company had a Barbados um, entity which owned the intangibles, acquired the intangibles at a very early stage of development and um, had a cost-sharing arrangement with the Canadian uh, group uh, to provide the development and mm -hmm. paid, um, uh, paid on a cost-plus basis yeah. for that, um, but also uh, recruited um, um, uh, candidates from the University of the West Indies, uh, undergraduates and postgraduates yeah. uh, and professors to actually uh, perform a lot of the work in Barbados. Uh, they went to Canada to be trained, and they performed the work in Barbados. So I think that's, a, that's a, an example of where they can justify a much uh, higher allocation to, uh, to the offshore entity. And you make a good point about embryonic uh, intangibles. And I think if you're going to have transfers of embryonic intangibles where there's no proven market, mm -hmm. you really have to document that really well. The IRS has not 2020, but 2010 vision. They think mm -hmm. that it was obvious when you transferred it back when it, embryonic that it was going to make a lot of money. But think of all the companies before the dot-com bust who are, no longer exist. Netscape, AOL. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's all kinds of companies that were high flyers that don't even have existence now. Uh, I, I don't know anything about Google. I know Google's being picked on by um, the UK. Mm -hmm. But I remember when Google was just run-of-the-mill search engine. And in fact, I remember people saying, what does that mean? And, um, and there was Yahoo, and there was a number mm -hmm. of other engines. And even though there was a bunch of competing engines, no one said, well, who cares? Uh, you know. And you know, back then, and I again, I don't know what their plan was, no one would have ever thought that Google would be the uh, blockbuster that it right. is now. Right. And I think the arm's length standard, if it has any meaning, means if you transfer something with an unproven, unknown uh, future mm -hmm. income, mm -hmm. there's a, there are means to price that. Now, as long as the losers get stuck in the tax tax effective jurisdictions yeah. as well yeah. as the winners, then I think that's legit. And I think that's where Xerox makes sense. And, you know, just giving you an example of um, losers in a reinsurance context, uh, just in Bermuda, you know, Bermuda doesn't always have successful insurance companies. Right. They go out of business too because Wilma and all the hurricanes mm -hmm. that come down mm -hmm. here, they've actually bankrupt some insurance companies. So I think it's important to, to do the pricing right. Mm -hmm. And if you do it right, there'll be times there's losers and sometimes there's winners. Another big issue, and I don't know if you were going to talk about uh, thin cap or interest deductibility, mm -hmm. I think it's more transfer pricing than anything yeah, else. It is, yeah. But um, you know, if you're a tax professional, tax 101 for international companies, the one obvious planning technique is you want to reduce your effective tax rate in the United States anyway, is to uh, have your U.S. subsidiary, if it's foreign owned, uh, incur a lot of debt to its parent and pay the parent instead of dividends, and you reduce your effective tax rate in the U.S. And it's a classic uh, planning opportunity. And, and, the, and the question is, how far can you go before it's tax avoidance? And the U.S. is actually a weird market. There is no regulation on this point. There is a statute, it's called Section 385, that deals with uh, thin cap, they don't call it that. And back in the 80s, Treasury actually tried to propose some regulations, and they were so criticized, their feelings got hurt. And so they withdrew all the regs, and now there's nothing out there but common law. And so in the case of the United States, it's a common law basis, but the other countries want to reduce this tax planning. And so they're all coming up with thin cap ratios or debt to equity ratios, et cetera. 
And what I think you're going to see as a minimum safe harbor is that any subsidiary that has a debt to equity ratio greater than the group average has to explain why it needs more debt than the group as a whole. I think they're going to give you an opportunity to explain why that's true, like an acquisition or whatever, but mm -hmm. um, you're going to have to deal with this. And this issue is so diplomatically sensitive, I, I shouldn't say diplomatically, it's so problematic, the transfer pricing people didn't want to touch it, so it's not in Working Party 6. They created a right. special new working party, in, which is representatives from the governments to deal on thin cap. And I apparently, and this is a joke, but there's some truth to it, they drew straws to see who got stuck with uh, chairing that committee. So, I think the other, the other interesting thing about this is that uh, in recent years, um, uh, there's been a practice developed whereby there's a provision in tax treaties now to say that countries can uh, apply their thin cap rules. Exactly. Uh, because uh, the earlier treaties, uh, a number of them, uh, overrode domestic law yep. with respect to thin capitalization. And, uh, and countries want to take that back into their own hands. So therefore, a lot of the treaties that are now uh, being developed will have rules that allow countries to apply their, their thin cap. Provisions. And that makes sense. And that gets to the point of residence and source yeah. and countries saying, we're not going to give everything away, we're going to carve this back for ourselves. And that's Australia's point of view, because yeah. Australia is kind of a weird country, in my opinion. I think it's more source than residence, <laughs> even though they've always been a, quote, resident uh, yeah. treaty uh, proponent. I guess the last issue, we've got about four or five minutes, is mm -hmm. permanent establishments. And this kind of relates to digital as well. Yeah. Tax authorities are frustrated that they see less boots on the ground, yet there's all this economic activity related to music files and books and whatever, and then they see a lot of activity where there's communications with their citizens through the internet. But again, there's no, there's no branch of, say, a bank or an insurance company or whatever. And I think bank's a bad example because regulators require some uh, physical presence. But they're, they're getting frustrated that there's all this economic activity which they may collect VAT or sales tax on or both, but they're not collecting any direct tax on. And so they're wondering if there's, they're not collecting direct tax because companies are misapplying what a permanent establishment is. And if you follow the treaties, currently, if you do preparatory or auxiliary activities, if you just scout the market, you do surveying, you provide a warehouse of the distribution of, say, books or whatever, if they're not uh, digital books, that doesn't create a taxable presence under treaties. And a lot of the countries saying, we're tired of this, we, we want to increase our tax base, and we may revisit the permanent establishment rules. The other issue that annoys them, and this is going to be dealt with both in the intangibles paper in this uh, outline is principal structures. What they don't want to see, and this also ties back to risk transfer, they don't want to see principal structures where all the decision making is purportedly made in Zug, Switzerland, or Luxembourg, or Ireland, or, or some other uh, low tax jurisdiction. And that um, where before this principal structure was created, a lot of profit was earned in France from distribution, sales, uh, whatever. They don't want to see a wholesale change in profitability because of a structuring that doesn't really change a lot of people activity. And I, I mentioned people activity because that's the theme that you're going to see in transfer pricing enforcement. A lot of the countries are going to look to where the people activity is. And they're not going to say that you can just make them limited risk distributors, lim limited risk contract or R&D analysis uh, companies, et cetera. They're going to say, listen, we're going to look at the whole value chain and we're not going to let all the residual profit go into these low tax jurisdictions unless there's true substance and people in those jurisdictions. I think also this, this ties back into the, uh, the digital economy uh, yes. project in Action, Action 1. Uh, you mentioned uh, that the, one of the proposals is, is to modify the permanent establishment definition uh, to widen it. There's another pr proposal which is to create a, a sort of a nexus, a new nexus based on a significant digital um, presence. So, yeah, exactly. Um, and uh, another one, of course, is that creating a, a virtual permanent establishment. So you have absolutely no physical presence at all in the country, but because you are supplying digital goods and services uh, primarily to residents of that country, that you'll be treated as having a permanent establishment. Right, and, and you might find this hard to believe, but one of the countries, I won't name it, said, well, you can block our people from accessing your website. The Chinese do it. Uh, there's a number of countries that do it. If you want to not block them, you are deemed to have your virtual PE, as you noted. And we want a uh, share of the direct profit that you make from having this global distribution chain. Yep. And so the question is, you know, in fairness to these countries, they're saying, well, the PE establishment rules were created 100 years ago when telephones were expensive. And so you wouldn't even call into another country. Mm -hmm. And, and so is the communication revolution, if you will, so, f so important that it might 
cause a change in how we define direct taxation rights. Right. 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 I'm not suggesting it's necessarily wrong, but the question is then how do you track that and how do you mm -hmm. allocate the virtual distribution in, say, the United States versus the UK versus India, whatever, and you're going to have to make companies track downloads or, uh, you know, whatever. I don't know what metrics you use in uh, virtual space. And I think the other aspect to this, of course, is consumption taxes. Yes. Uh, for example, VAT. Uh, and the proposal is that um, uh, uh, companies that um, supply digital goods and services into um, a jurisdiction should register for VAT and, and pay over VAT to, to that country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Which I think it's going to make, make the whole thing very, very complex. It is. In fact, VAT, there's a task force on VAT at the OECD. It's called um, Working Party 9, and they're dealing with this very issue. And they're trying to figure out how to divide uh, VAT revenue that may be between more than one country, right. how businesses should allocate their VAT expense mm -hmm. when they're producing something because VAT is uh, recoverable, and who has to pay that recovery? So let's say you were in the UK and you were buying intellectual prop, I'm sorry, IT services for the whole group, mm -hmm. and then you allocate those expenses, should the, and then you recover that. Right. Should the UK be paying all that recovery around the world, or should those local countries yeah. pay it? Yeah. I mean, it's a difficult question. So I think we've used up our hour. I think we've used up our hour. I think, the, uh, I think that brings us to the, um, one of the main topics that we we're supposed to talk about, and I think we can do that in conclusion. And that is, what is the effect of this project on offshore financial centers and, and their clients? And I think, um, I think we touched on a number of them. And it seems to me that uh, it will be far more complex. Um, it will be a far more complex environment in which offshore financial centers and their clients and the, the tax advisors uh, will, will, will have to operate in. Um, I think the, the burden of compliance on uh, offshore financial centers and their clients will increase mm -hmm. uh, through all of, these, uh, all of these initiatives. And if you also take into account the, the Financial Action Task Force and their, their new methodology, which is now going to be even more complex than before, uh, require even far more resources for countries to be able to, um, to deal with the reviews. You have the OECD Global Forum on Tax Information Exchange and uh, the, the peer review processes. And very often countries um, are going to be assessed uh, in the same year, both by the FATF and, and also by, by the OECD. And then all, you also now have this the whole issue of, of transfer pricing and the master file that you yes. talked about, uh, and uh, the compliance burden on, on multinationals that are operating around the world, including in offshore financial centers. I think it's going to make it a very challenging environment uh, going forward. I think so. I, I, I actually would prefer an academically more honest, I shouldn't say honest, more academically efficient solution from, mm -hmm. the, from the BEPS. I actually think companies are going to have more controversy and more arguments and l less certainty. And I, I actually think it's actually bad uh, from a tax policy efficiency point of view. I think also from, from the perspective of offshore financial centers within the Caribbean, most of them won't really be affected that much by the BEPS in itself. I think it's all of the other things that I mentioned that's really going to, going to affect them. Some countries, the treaty countries, um, like Barbados, for example, will right. be affected by uh, the BEPS and the treaty abuse provisions and, and the, uh, the issues dealing with the digital economy and a number of those treaty matters that we, that we, we touched on. Uh, but I think um, many of the countries are not treaty, uh, double taxation treaty countries, and so therefore won't be impacted by uh, some of the BEPS initiatives. Well, yeah, and I used to be a litigator for the IRS, and um, I remember one of the cases I worked on, it's a public case, uh, Northern Indiana, Indiana Public Company, NIPSCO, and the issue was whether conduit financing through a tax mm -hmm. haven should be subject to mm -hmm. withholding. And, you know, the IRS was gung-ho, and they just thought it was tax avoidance. And I remember, and I won't name an opposing counsel, they came out from another city, and they came in and they told us about, and read us all the history about Treasury how they wanted to encourage foreign direct investment in the United mm -hmm. States in the 1980s because the United States became a net debtor nation. Mm -hmm. And if we could not get money into this country, I guess we are in the U.S., uh, <laughs> uh, tax efficiently, mm -hmm. uh, the capital markets would become inefficient. And he was right. Uh, we still litigated because we didn't understand that. And the, the court got it right. They, they found that uh, that policy was part of the reason the tax right. rules were created the way they were. And so 
again, I, I think to your point, part of the problem is that you're going to have tax administrators who don't know all this policy that's being created right now, and they're going to enforce these rules over the next 5, 10, 20 years, and they're going to forget about what the purpose of all this was. And in some ways, I think it's going to be more confusing than helpful. Any questions? Oh, have we so confused you? I am I don't think they're taking it into your views fully, if I can phrase it that way. And I, I, and I don't mean being, I'm not trying to be a UN diplomat. I, I, I think you guys are not on the radar screen. I, and so to my earlier point, I think you guys need to get on the radar screen because I think there are legitimate economic activities in your country, Bermuda and other countries, which should be respected and shouldn't get swept under the rug, if you will, because of a few perceived abuses of transfer pricing. You know, we have a lot of good rules that deal with transfer pricing. In fact, I complimented Mike Williams from Treasury a year ago when they first came out with this and said, you guys do it better than any country. Yet he was criticized by one of his ministers for not being aggressive enough. But he was following the rules that they were supposed to. Mm -hmm. It was amazing how well he did. And so I think collateral damage, if you will, should not extend to the rest of the world. And I think you guys have to push back and saying, listen, we are legit. Here's our legitimate processes. Yes, we understand that tax evasion by individuals with secret bank accounts is, is bad. I, I think you have to give up on that issue. I don't mm -hmm. think anybody would not. Uh, but corporate taxation is not part and parcel to that. And it's important to keep these things, in my view, separate. But again, you guys need your sovereign nations. You guys have to uh, say what is within your interest as well. No. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Well, and, then, and, and there's tax evasion in the United States. What do you think the size of the <laughs> underground economy is? It's probably a third to 40 percent. I think the issue is that uh, the Caribbean countries have really not made their voices heard. Um, I think that's right. Uh, you know, we, have been, um, we haven't been coordinated. Um, I think the offshore financial centers in the Caribbean see themselves as in, being in competition. And so therefore, there is very little collaboration. Hopefully, that will, will change. Uh, with the uh, intervention of the Caribbean Export Development uh, Agency Task Force. And that's why Bermuda does a good job. Yeah. They have a lobby in the United States, to, to yeah. his point, yeah. and every time they want to make it difficult for reinsurance to go offshore, they say you can do that, the lobby, and I think the lobby says properly that you will dry up a bit the amount of capital available to bear risk in Florida, for example. Mm -hmm. Insurance, I, I, without a doubt, I think insurance on hurricane premiums would go up if the foreign markets weren't uh, as active they are through Bermuda to reinsure hurricane and earthquake risk. <laughs> and any other questions I think